This episode of the My Latin Life podcast is brought to you by Language Blend, the new best way to learn Spanish. Language Blend focuses on what you actually need to live and get by abroad with daily one-on-one lessons, a dedicated texting partner. It's like living in a Spanish-speaking country without ever leaving home. Go to languageblend.com for more information. Welcome back to the My Latin Life podcast. Since 2014, My Latin Life has been your trusted guide to traveling and living in Latin America. My guest today is Christian Nesheim, founder of IMI Daily, a leading publication on the investment migration industry. Christian, how's it going? I'd like to specify that we are the leading (laughs) publication on investment migration, but yeah, thank you. Uh, Thanks for having me. I love your Twitter account. I uh, loved seeing you at IMI Connect in, in Malta. Uh, it was great to get to know you there personally. I know you're, you're shy about sharing your face, so I felt privileged to, to get to, to see it. Just uh, for your readers out there, a wonderfully handsome man, uh, just in <laughs> case you didn't know. <laughs> you know, the audience won't be able to appreciate this at home, but I do have you on video here. Uh, recording uh, only audio, but but looking on video, which I don't normally do. So maybe this will have a bit of an extra oomph to it this episode. Yeah, yeah. let's hope so. I find that it helps just reading facial expressions and so on. Yeah, yeah. So Christian, uh, obviously in this episode, we're going to talk a lot about global mo- mobility, investment migration and everything. I just wanted to know one story about your background, because even though we met in person, I don't You know, sometimes I need the podcast to finally, uh, (laughs) like learn, truly learn about people. But, uh, so you, you're from Europe, obviously you did your MBA in China, which is pretty cool. And I never had a chance to talk to you about, and it seems like just straight after the MBA that led you directly into the investment migration industry. And we'd love to get the, the backstory from you a little bit. Uh, yeah, sure. I'm, uh, born and raised in Norway and then. After high school, I lived in a few different countries doing sort of odd work. Uh, I was in Spain for a while, France for a while. I was a, spent a little bit of time in Kenya. And then I went to college in California for three and a half years. And then, then I moved to China, uh, where I spent six years, mostly in a city called Chongqing, which is a huge city in the center of China that most people don't know about. I'm sure some of your readers will, though. It's a gigantic place. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I ended up taking my MBA there. And I always was fascinated by, I mean, I I have a libertarian bent, I guess you could say. Um, Always fascinated uh, by ways of, um, as, as, um, as it's called, finding freedom in an unfree world, uh, in a way. So I, I looked at okay, what are the industries that, uh, you know, how can I how can I work somehow in my daily life to promote or advance the cause of individual liberty? Um, and I saw that in investment migration, that was kind of the cutting edge of that, um, mm-hmm. where you could you know buy citizenships and residencies and uh, find sort of inter- international diversification for you as a person through through those programs. And so I got really interested in that. And I got a job with uh, one of the biggest uh, companies. So right straight out of my MBA, I got a job with one of the companies, mm-hmm. a leading company that does that. And uh, I worked for them for like a year and a half, a year and eight months, something like that. And then I started IMI. So that's kind of the the quick story of mm-hmm. how I got into investment migration. Is there a specific story or moment where you found out about this industry that investment migration exists? Was there? Uh, uh, it wasn't it wasn't one moment, I guess, you know, I was always reading, I was always reading uh, Doug Casey's International Man, Back when I was a teenager and when I was in college, uh, mm-hmm. then later on, uh, I should give a shout out to uh, Simon Black of uh, 
of uh, Sovereign Man. And of course, Andrew Henderson, my good friend uh, of Nomad Capitalist, uh, all, of, all of whom were great inspirations to me and kind of over time uh, led to my drifting in that direction. But no, I couldn't pin it down to a specific moment. There wasn't a particular experience. You know, I have a good passport. I have a great deal of mobility and travel and settlement rights with my Norwegian citizenship. So for me, it wasn't a, I, I mean, many people get interested in investment migration because they have a crappy passport with poor mobility rights, uh, poor settlement rights. And so for them, it's a, by virtue of necessity, they have to kind of acquire something better to improve their mobility. That was not really the case for me. I came more of, yeah, you, more added like from a whole people up to to have yeah. the same benefits that you do. Yeah, that's part of it. So, I, you know, I, I come from more of a philosophical angle, I guess, than than from a practical angle. But now I'm, you know, I'm out there with everybody else collecting residencies and citizenships. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's hard not to. Uh, once you get started, it's kind of like it's addicting. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> So you started IMI. I I didn't realize originally how long it had been around. Um, what's like the early days story, the founder story of IMI? Oh man, we, I mean, I started, I say we, because now we're we, but it was just me in the beginning and I started it in June. Officially, we, we launched in June 2017 and didn't really make any money. For the first like six months, uh, probably didn't break even until like a year. Um, but since then, it's it's gone it's gone pretty well. Uh, but yeah, it's it was just me on a laptop. Started out in China, and then eventually, I moved to Spain. Spent three years there doing IMI, and then now I'm in Portugal for the last uh, year and a half. So, so yeah, it's just bootstrapped. You know, pretty pretty simple operation. Uh, very low. Uh, very low fixed costs. So, yeah. Well, congrats on how you've built this thing up to be the leading publication. (laughs) And uh, I guess for a little bit more context, you alluded to it. Now you're running in-person conferences and you're bringing together all of the heavy hitters in the investment migration industry in the same building, competitors, friends, and you have conferences and you talk about different issues that are facing the investment migration industry. Yeah. I mean, I think people don't realize how much, I mean, how many people actually have a full-time job uh, just helping people with investment migration. I mean, it's one thing in Latin America, you know, uh, there's a there's a lot of stuff you could do yourself when you want to get like a rentista visa or something like that. But for the major programs, you typically need uh, or you would want the help of a professional. And there are tens and tens of thousands of people working on this full time globally. And there's probably millions tangentially involved, you know, if we're talking about wealth managers and private banks and family offices and so right. on. And they all need kind of a place where they can get uh, unbiased information um, about what's going on in the industry, new policies, data, trends, insights, this type of thing. Uh, mm-hmm. Every every industry of every industry worth its salt has a kind of uh, trade journal. Like I'm sure there's a Plumbers Weekly and a uh, whatever Golfers Golf Coach Digest or something like this, right? Yeah. And so yeah. <laughs> there wasn't really anything for investment migration. Um, and there needed to be. And so there's clearly a, a demand for that. So primarily our readers, we write for the people who work in this industry, but inevitably um, a large number of what I call sophisticated end users mm-hmm. also read IMI because mm-hmm. they want to understand the industry's own view of itself. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, we write primarily with the professionals in mind, but that isn't to say that the content on IMI isn't also super valuable for the end user. So, mm-hmm. and it's at like fifty fifty at this point. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell, but just like roughly uh, gauging by the domain names in the emails on our newsletter list, I would say yeah, it's probably around fifty fifty. Yeah. Cool. Shout out all the advanced users. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> of course, of course. There's a lot of sophisticated, casual visitors. 
yeah sophisticated audience that we have yeah cool and so um i imagine that when you start a trade publication for mm -hmm. this industry investment migration i'm sure people had mixed feelings about it i'm sure a lot of people have either told you to take down articles or sure. you shouldn't talk about this or that topic or, or yeah. millions of different things. All and the time. Yeah. So what you're talking about, I guess, fundamentally is the competing and equally valid interests of privacy and transparency, which are kind of contradictory things. You can, It's hard to satisfy one and and also the other at the same time. But what I can say is, yes, you're right. For, for absolutely, there are companies and individuals that try to influence uh, us to write about or not write about different things in the industry. But ultimately, everybody benefits from the transparency. We publish good news and bad news. And people appreciate that transparency and the the honesty until it's about something they care about, right? Until it goes, uh, you know, there might be, for example, one, one company is really promoting this one program and then we write a piece of bad news about that one program and then that company will come to me and like, hey, why are you writing it this way? Shouldn't you be writing it that way? Uh, <laughs> you know, this kind of thing. So, so they are unhappy with me in the moment because it happens on that day the negative news is about the thing they care about and they don't want me to write about that. But all the other days of the year when I'm writing about something else and someone else is the subject of that negative news story, then they're happy about it. So it's really a situation where on any given day, if we write a negative but necessary story, we are, you know, one party is disgruntled and everybody else sees the benefit of it. And then the next day, there's some other individual party that's disgruntled and everybody else is happy. So that's, that's kind of the mandate of a news publication. It's to mm -hmm. highlight, let's say undesirable circumstances, uh, in the, the world, a yeah. range of emotions, <laughs> the full rate, the whole gamut. <laughs> exactly. You re you referenced a number 10,000 plus professionals working full time in this industry. And I'd love to hear, um, maybe a little context from you about how this industry came about in terms of professionalizing itself. And actually, you've probably played a role in that as well. Maybe you could explain it better. Sure. Um, so it's not 10,000 plus, it's tens of thousands and probably in excess of 60, 70,000, just back of the napkin calculation, 60, 70,000 people work full time on pure play investment migration. And then you have all the others you mentioned, like family offices and wealth managers who who need to know about investment migration, but who also do other things primarily, but, but they have clients that could use these types of services. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a lot of people. Now, as to your question about the industry, you know, the when it was a nascent industry, uh, if you go back, let's say 20 years, you only had like, four or five um, investment like pure play investment migration programs worldwide. You had very few um, investment migration programs. And so hmm. that I, I would say, you know, one of the, we should highlight the early, the early ones, you know, in the mid eighties, they started up in Canada with a federal investor program, mm -hmm. which for many years was, you know, the only major investor visa of its kind. Uh, Later on, the Americans started with it. Uh, in Europe, it was brought about by essentially the first wave, I would say, was after the sovereign debt crisis in Southern Europe uh, in the wake of the 08 financial crisis. So in like 2009, 2010, 2011, when the uh, ignominiously known pigs countries, Portugal, Italy, Greece, Spain, were... Uh, running out of money essentially because uh, they had, well, we don't need to get into the story of why they were running out of money, but suffice it to say that they w had a sovereign debt crisis and they needed to raise unencumbered capital quickly. And one 
very quick way they found of doing that was to open investor migration programs. And so uh, in the early 2010s, we saw a bunch of them open up in uh, Southern Europe. And then you had another wave in 2011, 2012, because of the Arab Spring, uh, there's huge demand for these types of programs then. And then separately, or in parallel, I should say to this, you had uh, a wave of citizenship by investment programs opening up in the Caribbean. I, I Here, I think we have to give credit where credit is due. Um, I would highlight uh, Chris Kalin, of, uh, who's the chairman of uh, Henley & Partners, who was instrumental in pioneering uh, the Caribbean citizenship by investment market. Because although you had had citizenship by investment as a legal provision on the books in the Caribbean for many years already. These were poorly defined. Uh, you know, it was more like what we think of a citizenship by discretion nowadays, right? Citizenship right. by... Or you get the honors. Uh, you get like special honor citizenship. Yeah, correct. So kind of like that. Like merit-based. Merit, so Yeah, it, yeah. Merit-based citizenship, like Steven Seagal or something. Correct. So <laughs> but, but then what happened after that is that... that uh, I know, I know this. Uh, so Chris Kalin, he went to the Caribbean. Uh, him and some other guys. I'm sorry if I'm forgetting their names, <laughs> but they uh, essentially found a way to streamline and standardize that whole citizenship by investment process and put a specific price tag and specific boxes that you needed to tick to make the process formulaic and predictable. So mm -hmm. I've said in my articles before that. That he's kind of like, like Chris Kalin was kind of like the, the Henry Ford of citizenship by investment in the sense that he didn't invent citizenship by investment, but he did standardize and popularize it. And then they kind of, other people took that same model and copied it to many other countries. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's good background. So how did it work prior to that? Because there was rich people moving around prior to the 1980s. Yeah. Sure. I, I mean, how did it work prior to the 1980s? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm born in 1988 <laughs> and, I, and I, have a, I have a relatively um, limp grasp on, on history if you go that far back. But um, I mean, I'm sure it was happening in the past, but also in the past, it's true, as you say, a lot of this was done in-house by the people who had the clients. So... HSBC, for example, was huge in, in Canada in doing uh, the Canada Federal Investor Program. But they mm -hmm. only did the Canada Federal Investor Program. They didn't do like... Yeah, that's interesting. Can we, ask, yeah. can we talk about that? So yeah. like banks used to be directly involved in these programs and they've sort of gotten out of it, would you say? Yeah, I, I think that... Uh, and this probably has to do... I, I don't know, but it, it probably has to do with the... Uh, the increasing regulatory burden and the the AML KYC issues involved in all of this that they they kind of said look uh, we'll 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 start sending our private clients to these uh, citizenship by investment companies instead of keeping it in house we'll let them do it and you know uh, a lot of the people who a lot today run some of the biggest uh, for example Eric Major who runs Latitude or um, Hakan Kordelek, who runs Beyond Immigration, uh, guys like those, they started out in the banking industry in Canada and they were helping people with uh, the Canadian Federal Immigrant Investor Visa. Um, and later on, you know, they went on to just focus on that, but outside of the confines of, of the mm -hmm. bank. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. So regulation probably led this industry to kind of... Um branch off on its own. I, I, yeah, I also think that it kind of needed to do that because um, it's hard to soar as an industry if you're tied down by that regulation. Because if you're in banking, I mean, banking is subject to some of the strictest regulation in the world, right? Yeah, true. Uh, whereas investment migration is largely unregulated. Uh, which which is what's allowed it to be nimble and quick to adapt. And, uh, you know, there are no, very low barriers to entry in the investment migration market. Anybody with a laptop can start an investment migration company. Uh, but that wouldn't be the case if, if they had to live by the same rules that banks have to live by. Makes sense. 
Do you think that we've passed some sort of heyday in this industry, or do you think that we're kind of at the zenith now and it's going to keep growing in terms of uh, participants, programs, et cetera? I, I think we've only seen the tip of the iceberg. Really, I really do. Because I think it, it used to be that, well, who in the past, who in the past could do these programs? Well, it was people who had uh, a lot of money and people who could be kind of location independent. But now so many people can be location independent, like huge mm-hmm. swaths of the global population are working remotely. And they, it means their income is not tied to any particular location, right? Mm -hmm. Which means that they can move around more easily. And so um, in, in parallel to that, what's happening is that investment migration, not in all cases, but in many cases is becoming cheaper because there's competition now in the citizenship and residence by investment market. There are many, many programs and they're competing with each other. Uh, they're competing on being more streamlined, but they're also competing on price. So, you know, one European golden visa can't suddenly triple its price without seeing uh, demand crater, right? And so this is keeping a lid on prices, which means it becomes available to increasingly large amounts of people. And I think that that's, I mean, it's just going to proliferate, just going to get, we're going to have more and more people participating in residence by investment, citizenship by investment, independent means visas, which are, Mm -hmm. I have to highlight independent means visas because uh, Latin America is like world champions at this. These are like the rentista, pensionado, uh, those types of programs where you, you know, still capital based in the sense that you have to demonstrate a certain minimum income or savings. Um, But, those are now super interesting because everybody's working remotely. And the thing about golden visas is that they gave you the immigration status without you having to be there. And so that's why they were expensive. But if you can be there, you don't need to invest. Then you can just do an independent means visa. And and an enormous amount of people are doing that now. And uh, I really don't see that slowing down. It's just going to become, it's just going to increase. Mm-hmm. And by the way, if anyone noticed Christian's excellent R role there, uh, fun fact, Christian speaks very good Spanish, like fluent Spanish. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, I have a, a Venezuelan wife. Um, we've been together for five years. So people tell me I have a bit of a, a Venezuelan twist to my accent. Hey guys, quick break from the episode to tell you about BitRefill. BitRefill allows you to shop online and in person without banks, converting your crypto directly into merchant balance. We're talking gift cards to Nike, Amazon, Apple, Airbnb, Hotels.com, and many more, all paid for with crypto. BitRefill offers more than 10,000 gift card options in 180 countries, including the USA, Canada, all across Latin America, including Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, Argentina, El Salvador, and many more. You can also apply the code MyLatinLife at checkout to get 10% back on your first purchase. Go to bitrefill.com for more information. So switching gears here, I would love to get you going and give us the background on your motto. So the motto of IMI is the world isn't free, but you can be. Yeah. Okay. So Thanks for asking, by the way, <laughs> uh, this motto, uh, how do I explain it? So it's when, when I was in my late teens, early twenties, I wasted an inordinate amount of time trying to win people over to my way of thinking, uh, to loving Liberty, to believing Liberty is better, uh, to seeking freedom in the world, etc. But I, I came up against this brick wall all the time where people were either not listening or they're pretending to listening or they're just wasting my time. And really I realized a lot of people actually don't want to be free. Um, To a lot of people, I think it's terrifying to them to think that you might have to take responsibility for your own life, make your own decisions that rather, you know, take responsibility for your own health, your own security, They would rather, uh, 
you know, outsource that in a way to the government, etc. But I wanted to be free. Uh, and I realized that if like you're, you're not going to get anywhere trying to win people over to your way of thinking at scale or trying to join politics and quote unquote change the system from the inside uh, because people don't want to be free. And, it, and if they don't want to be free, you know, you also shouldn't force them to be free. That would be a contradiction of terms, right? Uh, in a sense, they should be free to not be free if that's what they want, so to speak. But at the same time, we can't permit those people to dictate whether you or I are free. And so I think the only option that's left to us, and it's a viable option, is for us to seek freedom personally and find freedom for ourselves and the people that we care about, and then lead by example. Uh, and, you know, if you're, if you're trying to change things from the inside and you're continuously, you know, hitting your head uh, against the wall with these people, you're, you're going to become frustrated. You're going to become bitter, unsatisfied. Um, but if you, if you find, I mean, and if you're bitter and unsatisfied, then you're not a good ambassador for freedom and that way of thinking. People are going to look at you and be like, oh, if that's what libertarian looks like, I don't want to be libertarian, right? So what you got to do instead, I think, is to focus on you finding freedom, leading by example, prospering, being happy. And <laughs> once you do that and people see that, then those same people that years ago didn't want to listen to you, they come to you and ask how you did it. And I have personal experience in this regard. Like people who you tried to, who I tried to talk to, about this, uh, just weren't interested. But then, then la years later, they see you know that freedom works, and then they come to you. And anyway, and even if they don't come to you later on, at least you're free, right? So yeah, find freedom in an unfree world, like Harry Brown said. I say the world isn't free, but you can be, and I really mean that. You, as an individual, you know, you don't have to try to change the world. Uh, just change the conditions your personal conditions, the conditions of those people that you care about and the world will follow or not, but at least you'll be free. Mm -hmm. And you said a name there, which is Harry Brown. Um, I should know this better, <laughs> but off the top of my head, this is, he's an American who wrote the book freedom in an unfree world, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He he wrote how I found freedom in an unfree world. He yep. was an entrepreneur. He was also, um, uh, libertarian candidate for president at one point, I think. Mm -hmm. um, it's a great book. Everybody should read it. And he was like living in Switzerland or the Italian Riviera, something like that. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't remember. <laughs> could be, could be. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. And that that book's hard to get your hands on these days. I think. That's right. That's right. I I had a physical copy of it that I got uh, via eBay back when that was still a thing. Whatever happened to that guy? Have you ever tried to... Is he alive still? Like, have you no, tried no, to reach no, out to him? No, he died years ago. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Didn't make his way <laughs> to the I My newsletter. No, he didn't. <laughs> yeah, but if you, if you dig up those old writings, like, it's pretty sweet. It's one of those books, kind of like The Sovereign Individual. Yeah. That yeah that's a Twitter account read. right there, man. Yeah. You can, you, can just, you can just quote that book, and that's your Twitter account. Here you go. Free business idea. Because there is one that's like sovereign individual quotes, and all it does is quote that book. But I haven't seen one for finding freedom in an unfree world yet. No, but, uh, someone's going to start that Twitter account after this uh, podcast. <laughs> if, ah, well, there's another book recommendation for for you guys. So, on the topic of freedom, like, what is is there something that really pushed you in this direction or makes you feel so strongly about this? Because you you grew up in Norway, you somehow got to San Francisco uh, for for university, so things were things were pretty good. You know what I mean? Like what? <laughs> yeah, um, that's true. Like you know, it's it's one thing arguing against socialism if you're in Venezuela, right? Which is it's a pretty it's pretty easy to make a persuasive argument, but when you're in Norway, 
people look around and say, hey, but this socialism thing works, right? So um, that was also always kind of an uphill battle. Um, it's not that I personally suffered a lot of injustices, except for egregious tax rates. Uh, <laughs> but but apart from that, I was always generally free to do as I, I pleased. But, um, but yeah, no, I was just philosophically inclined uh, toward liberty. It just, it, it lights a fire in my belly, so to speak. Yeah. I think everyone gets hyped up. I got really hyped up after, um, watching the Milton Friedman documentary. Oh, free to choose from free the eighties. Oh my God, man. Yeah. That changed my life. I'm telling you when I was like 18, 19, I watched that whole thing. I freaking love Milton Friedman, Milton Friedman. I actually, I, I once had lunch with his son. Um, anyway, that's another story, but yeah. Uh, huge Milton Friedman fan. Everybody should watch the Free to Choose series. Dude, hit us with any random stories because it's a unique set of people that I imagine you're meeting just based on your industry with doing investment migration. You definitely meet a pretty wide range of people across the spectrum of like rich asset managers to authors to, you know, anarchists or like all these different things, right? You know, actually, uh, in the early days of IMI, uh, most of the people I've been coming across have been kind of straight-laced people, uh, like you say, wealth managers, investment migration firms, people who wear ties to work. Uh, I haven't been that involved in the, let's say, the younger, wilder demographic <laughs> demographic segment of, of investment migration, which is, I mean... Uh, getting to know Andrew Henderson kind of brought me into that fold. You're part of that. You know, there's a bunch of Twitter accounts that I follow that I think uh, are a bit salty for my my audience, my general audience. You know, um, but but I, yeah, I have I have met a lot of very interesting people, and I continue to meet uh, a lot of people who really inspire me. A lot of people who live freedom. A lot of people who who really lead by example and who are brave right like mm -hmm. think think of andrew for example how brave you have to be to believe so much in your principles that you actually give up your american citizenship right that's courage man that guy single-handedly built a what is it it's a nine figure no, eight figure business high eight figure business by now on his own starting like just bootstrapping twitter account youtube you know, uh, I have to highlight Andrew is a major, major inspiration for me. Um, but there are other mm -hmm. people, too, uh, in the industry. I believe I've mentioned some. Um, so, yeah, lots of lots of interesting people. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that's what we're trying to do is to go more into the, the professional realm and and start merging the two worlds together. Because um, yeah. it, it's interesting. It's like. There's um, there's different target markets. There's the younger digital nomads that are very tech savvy and remote, and a lot of them are big in crypto. Yeah. There's expats that are maybe middle aged that have a family overseas and they have like a different set of requirements. And then there's retirees that maybe can't afford to to retire yeah. in uh, Canada, the United States, or or some expensive place, and so. They're looking at uh, cheaper locales to retire on a, you know, a modest pension. So you have all these different uh, client avatars or customer avatars in this right. industry. Yeah, and some of those avatars have more money than other avatars, <laughs> right? Uh, so they're they're different target audiences. I mean, they have the same general interests, but they have different means uh, and different ways of getting to that goal. But I think uh, I totally agree that we. You know, IMI and and my Latin life uh, and Nomad Capitalist and a bunch of others are kind of merging those two worlds because, you know, 10 years from now, our generation, we're going to be the ones running the world, right? And we're going to have money. And so I want to be, you know, I don't want to just write for the 55-year-old uh, executives in, in ties. I also want to... Uh, lead a conversation with the people who are, you know, right now, maybe just exploring their first uh, independent means visa in Southeast Asia or, or Latin America, but who 10 years from now are going to have, you know, some serious 
shekels to invest, mm-hmm. right? I'm, I'm building a relationship with those people too, uh, because okay, even though they might not have you know tremendous purchasing power right now, we are kindred spirits, and uh, I want them. I want them in in my boat. You know, I I come from a business like a business finance background, but then went into like kind of Silicon Valley tech in order to find my freedom the way same way you found your freedom in a way that, you know, worked best for your situation. And now it's kind of coming back full circle where I'm starting to view things this again as like uh, as from like the financial product perspective. Yeah, and and it is to a great extent because that's that's the world that a lot of the clients come from. Uh, not necessarily, I mean, okay, most people who do investment migration, uh, where, where there's an investment component, at least, mm-hmm. most of those people are independent business owners. And they have advisors who help them with their portfolio allocations or whatever. And those advisors increasingly are getting questions from their clients about investment migration options. Um, and so uh, there's a lot that investment migration companies need to know about wealth management and vice versa, but they're inextricably linked. And so there's a huge amount of cross pollination going on between those two sectors. Yeah. Yeah. So let's switch gears a bit. Maybe we could start, uh, venturing towards Latin America, talking about Latin America and how, uh, maybe what piece of the puzzle Latin America plays in the whole investment landscape as a whole and how that seems to be changing and maybe Latin America is is growing in popularity. That seems to be your experience. Yeah. um, And this is related to a couple different trends. First of all, um, if you go back just a few years, everything was about Europe, United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia. This is where people wanted to get residence permits. This is where people wanted to get citizenship. The legacy brand. That's right. The legacy (laughs) brand. That's right. Um, And then a few things have happened recently. So number one, COVID um, with the lockdowns and all of that. And people kind of seeing, well, which countries would you have wanted to be in during COVID? And also just a feeling of, of... suffocation that came with lockdowns. Um, So people started looking around for alternatives and they started working remotely. Um, And then in Europe and North America, but in Europe, you had a war breakout, right? In Ukraine. Uh, So that kind of dented or they put it, it put a dent in the image that Europe had as kind of this ancient amusement park. (laughs) <laughs> uh, or, or, <laughs> I like that. I haven't heard it that way. I like that. Uh, uh, well, uh, you heard it here first. Yeah. So, so um, a lot of Europeans now started to question, well, is this where I want to be? And so that coupled with uh, increasing remote work uh, really got people thinking about, okay, where, where might I want to live now? If I, if I'm location independent and, you know, the legacy brand countries aren't the end all be all anymore. They're not, they're not the alpha omega that they once were. I can't actually like, especially if you're from the legacy brand countries, you, I mean, you talk a lot about this on your Twitter account, how, you know, you can radically raise your standard of living overnight by relocating, right? Lower your costs and, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, just, just live, live, have a higher quality of life. And, and Latin America, uh, you know, it has a lot of these programs more so, I mean, Asia has a lot of them too, but in Latin America, practically every country, except I think Bolivia is like the only one that doesn't have any kind of investment migration program. Maybe it does, at least I haven't seen it, but these programs are super prevalent in Latin America. And when Europe is at war, then, you know, historically, and I've written about this on IMI, you can check it out if you want. There's an article called um, Why Every Mobility Portfolio Needs a Western Hemisphere Allocation. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Latin America and especially the Southern Cone is kind of where you want to be if there is uh, some kind of global, whether it be war or like a nuclear threat or whatever, because it's like on the way to nowhere. So like Argentina, Paraguay, uh, Uruguay, Chile, right there, these places are, they're isolated. They are energy independent to, yeah, to a large extent. Right, not, right. Not, grow not, their not, own food. Yeah. They grow their own food. Um, they're not going to get invaded by anyone. Right, right. Long, I, you long. saw that map that was like the nuclear map and it was the least likely place was that's like right. Brazil that's or right. Argentina. Yeah. Plus you have the, um, uh, the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, from yep. the uh, 1800s, where where President Monroe basically told the European powers to stay the hell out of the Western Hemisphere, that he would consider any incursion in the Western Hemisphere as a direct threat to the United States, and and that has since been formalized through the Rio Pact and, and other uh, multilateral uh, treaties. Yep. And so, at least as the United States, at least as long as the United States is the global military hegemon um you you don't have to fear any military invasions in latin america of course you you still have to be careful about you know unorganized crime or even organized mm-hmm. crime but like at the local level in latin america but so, so let me yeah. stop you there yeah. um you mentioned something that was interesting that everyone was trying to move to the legacy brand countries before hmm. and now people are increasingly considering Latin America, Southeast Asia, other options. Yeah. Has the clientele and the makeup of the customer base also changed as well? Whereas before and probably still, it was primarily people from tier B and tier C countries that were looking to upgrade their passport to get a better passport or move to the first world. Whereas, and and traditionally Canadians, Americans, Europeans said, oh, what's the point of a second passport? It doesn't do anything for me. That was kind of the vibe, but I'm sure post 2020, you've seen an increase in Americans, Europeans, Canadians open to the idea that like, yeah, we need, you know, a second passport. We need another residency. So ha- have you seen that, that shift take place? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, the, the biggest one, the most obvious one, which you also touched on was that uh, as soon as the pandemic started, we saw a huge uptick in interest from Americans, huge, huge uptick. Um, and they're now the Americans are now like uh, among the top applicant nationalities in Portugal, Golden Visa, Spain, uh, Greece, uh, and a host of other programs. Uh, and they just never used to be. But I guess that the pandemic um, highlighted or for, highlighted for them that okay, yeah, you have an American passport, so what? You still can't go anywhere, right? Um, that was a, that was a big thing because before. It used to be all, like you said, tier B, tier C countries, like, uh, you know, people from the Middle East, uh, people from like uh, Indonesia Russia. and stuff. All yeah, the, not yeah. that much because they, they were kind of like mm, still getting into the middle income segment. So there weren't like that many Indonesian high net worth individuals yet. But like Russia, CIS, um, China was obviously a huge one, you know. If you're Chinese, you have a Chinese passport, you have, what, like 60-something visa-free countries you can travel to, and most of them are like diplomatic best buddies in Africa. Um, so, so yeah, those people had a pressing need for it. But then, back then, it was all about, I, I need to stay in China and work on my business because the economy here is growing super fast, and I want to... Uh, stay here to make money, but I'd like to have the option to, uh, travel more, or I'd like to have the option to resettle in Portugal, or I'd like to send my kid to Eton or Harrow school for boys or whatever in, in England and send my wife there. Uh, but I want to stay right. But then since the pandemic, what we're seeing a lot more of is people are actually physically relocating. And that's why also, um, demand is shifting somewhat away from, I mean, not in absolute terms, but in, in relative terms, the balance is shifting a little bit away from investment based migration toward, uh, independent means visas, 
mm-hmm. because people are actually physically relocating in a way that they or at a scale they weren't in the past. Yeah, so many interesting subtopics there. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Quick break from the podcast to tell you about Language Blend, the best new way to learn Spanish. Language Blend was co founded by Jake Nomada, friend of the podcast, decade of experience in Latin America. And Jake and his team, they put everything into this program that they wish they had in terms of how to level up quickly with your Spanish language skills. Because the faster that you can get conversationally fluent in Spanish, the better the experience that you're going to have in Latin America. So go to languageblend.com for more information. Investment immigration industry, the way I see it, seems super obsessed with golden visas. And I feel like they're not giving nearly enough uh, emphasis to, yeah, the independent means visas of which there's many different types. Yeah. There's non-lucrative, there's rentista, there's pensionado, and Correct. there's all these ones. And yeah, it's, it's true, as you say, that that focuses on the golden visas, on citizenship by investment. So I would say golden visas plus citizenship by investment. That's what everybody's marketing. That's uh, yeah, what everybody's focusing on. Yeah, but I mean, th- there's a perfectly natural explanation for that. And it's, well, that's where the margins are. Right. Uh, because that's where, you know, those programs, you have to invest uh, a six figure amount of money, sometimes seven figures. Right. And uh, so, so that's obviously what promoters are going to promote. You know, they want to make money. There's, you can still make money from doing independent means visas, you charge, but you can only charge a service fee. So you have to do huge volumes for it to be as interesting as mm-hmm. selling, you know, some guy in China who sells, uh, uh, who finds a client for EB-5 in the United States, for example, I mean, they can easily make 50, 60 grand in commission, right? Uh, there's, there's no way he's making that on a rentista visa in Argentina, <laughs> right? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a juicy number. Uh, one more quick question related to this before we jump back to Latin America. So we, we, we've probably seen an increase in Americans getting into this space as clients, but I imagine that it's still not keeping up with the demand from Asia. Would you say the majority of this industry in terms of the residencies, the citizenships, et cetera, the majority of the demand is coming from Asia and, and Asia still eclipses the rest of it or where's like the, the balance of power, you know? Yeah. Um, so Asia is always going to win just because Asia has like half the world's population, right? That's, that's number. So any, any like nationality distribution, uh, it's natural for them all else being equal. They should dominate every nationality distribution. But that being said, I would, let's, I would split the market into, you know, for independent means visas. I don't think that the Asians are necessarily uh, the leaders there. I think North Americans uh, at least are the leaders in Latin America for independent means visas. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. But when it comes to golden visas in Europe, yeah, the big nationalities are still China, uh, Vietnam, uh, yeah. Le- Indonesia, Philippines a little bit. But Should I start up a My Latin Life Twitter in Chinese or something? <laughs> uh, I mean, they, they don't have Twitter in China, so... <laughs> yeah, but- <laughs> good Vietnam. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, in in yeah, I'll I'll do it in Hindi. Yeah, yeah, you can probably Google Translate that. (laughs) Yeah, no, no, but it's it's uh, that's the case. It's um, it's still you know Asia still dominates. Uh, Middle East is also huge, especially for citizenship. Um, Russia CIS they have always been really interested in getting their money and their kids out of uh, Russia CIS, but. At the same time, now they have fewer options because they're excluded from so many programs, right? Uh, which all, only means that the programs that remain open to Russians are seeing record traffic. And that's the case, for example, mm-hmm. with uh, the Turkey citizenship program or Golden Visa in Dubai and so on. Mm-hmm. And I think we were talking about this a bit, how everyone's focus used to be Europe, the ancient playground. How was it? Uh, I think I said uh, ancient. Uh, uh, like <laughs> anyway, ancient theme yes. park or uh, ancient theme park. Yeah, <laughs> something like it was that. The ancient theme park. We got the ruins. We got the yeah 
uh, the gelato. So Europe's good. And that's where everyone's focus was. Now we're seeing probably a couple reasons for Latin America growing in popularity. Yep. One, maybe Europe is not as economically strong as it was before. Maybe, um, you know, it's uh, uh, more tense than it was before. Maybe it's more expensive than it was before. Maybe it's yeah. less safe than it was before. All of that. I, I think uh, everybody should just get a couple of residencies in Latin America, especially permanent residencies, which I like to think of as call options on citizenship, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not, it, that's an oversimplification, but, and, and Parvis Malakuti will arrest me on this when he hears your podcast, but, but um, essentially it's a call, uh, permanent residency is essentially a call option on citizenship in that it can sit there and, Right. If one you day qualify and not claim it, yeah, yeah. Well, you could, if you have PR and if you had it for a number of years, then typically you'll be eligible to apply for citizenship. So it's an option that you can exercise mm -hmm. as and when you need it. And so many of the ones that they have in Latin America are just so easy to get right now. And as they become more popular, they probably won't be. I mean, some of the more popular ones will probably become. Uh, less easy to get, right? If Asuncion starts crawling with Canadians, uh, then the, the government in Paraguay is probably going to say, hey, we're going to raise the fees or we're going to you know, extend the timeline or something like that. So I just think it's a good idea to have the Western Hemisphere allocation, especially in the Southern Cone. Um, then you can start, you know, you can, you can invest in some property there maybe. You can... Uh, you know, get your cedula, eventually your citizenship, um, and you, you know, build your little circle there, bury some gold coins on your finca, and, you know, you can have kind of off-grid, something off-grid down there um, that that you may or may not use in the future. But it's, but it's there, and it's practically free, so take it, man. Mm -hmm. And I think... Uh... You've been secretly toying with the idea a little bit, right? Like get some farmland in Southern Cone, something like that. Yeah, you know, it's a public forum. I don't. I want to be careful about, uh, you know, broadcasting my my intentions. But all right, but, all right. We'll but, keep but, a secret. But you're down. Yeah, you're yeah, down. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm totally down, man. I, I have uh, several processes uh, already in motion. There. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> processes in motion. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Good stuff. And what do you think it is that's unique about Latin America? So we mentioned about how they have the rentista visa, which is largely unique to Latin America. Do you think, um, you know, how huge is that? And do you think that there are other characteristics of Latin America as a residence or a second citizenship destination make it make Latin America distinct from uh, Europe and the rest of the world? Uh, so <clears throat> I think Latin America should be compared to Southeast Asia uh, because they, those two regions kind of, they have a lot in common. They offer a lot of the same benefits, you know, mm -hmm. low cost, excellent climate. Obviously, Southeast Asia is a great deal safer than Latin America in terms of uh, you know, I like there are, there are plenty of neighborhoods in Latin America where you don't want to walk alone at night. That's less, much less the case in Southeast Asia. On the other hand, uh, in Southeast Asia, you have the potential for, you know, regional military conflict in a way that you don't really have in Latin America. Latin America is in the same time zone, more or less, as the United States, so that's definitely a, a plus. It's, it's it's you know nearer to the United States, so mm -hmm. that that makes it interesting for North Americans, Canadians too. Um, and you know both regions have roughly six hundred fifty million people, Latin America and and uh, Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they offer a lot of similar things. They have some rentista visas in in uh, Southeast Asia too, but. Uh, but yeah, again, it's farther away. And it's also, you know, it's very hard to get citizenship in Southeast Asia. That's probably the most important thing to mention. Yep. 
I shouldn't have waited till the end to mention that, but it just occurred to me. But in Southeast Asia, you'll always be a Falang, you know, you'll always be a foreigner. Um, you, you'll never fit in. Right. It's hard to like psychologically build a home when you're just on like a residency visa as opposed to being a citizen. That's or, right. Or owning your home instead of leasing. Yeah. So, okay. Just, so in Southeast Asia, you have a lot of restrictions on, you know, getting citizenship there, even getting PR can be super tricky. Uh, owning property, right? There are lots of restrictions on foreigners yeah. owning property in Southeast Asia that you don't have. Um, culturally, uh, yeah. it's very, very different in a way that Latin America is not religious. I, I, I bet a lot of people know this stuff actually already because our, yeah. our, <laughs> yeah, sure. our, our, our listeners are so sophisticated as we've That's admitted. Right. That's right. What's your, what's your call? What's your bet? Do you think uh, Asia is going to open in the future in terms of allowing foreigners to get citizenship in terms of residencies opening up more, you know, they have like, like Cambodia opened a program. Uh, Malaysia always has like a couple random programs. Do you think Asia is going to open up more? So yeah, Cambodia uh, has always kind of been at the forefront in terms of welcoming foreigners like all the way, going all the way by like giving them citizenship and PR and, and these things that, which you don't, you cannot get in Malaysia. Uh, and it's hard to get it in most Asian countries. But I do think at the same time, uh, especially in East Asia, that have these super top heavy population pyramids that... They might have to to get the young yeah, people. Yeah. They might be forced to. And I'm kind of, I'm seeing signs of this in South Korea, for example. South Korea now will get, straight up give you citizenship after five years of residency. Right, right, right. Uh, which is kind of unique in, in East Asia. Japan is liberalizing on this. China, I'm, I'm bearish on China in general. Uh, I don't necessarily want to go into detail. I might end up on some kind of government list or something but and i have to travel to china sometimes but i'm, I'm generally suffice it to say i'm bearish on the future of china uh and that's coming for someone who spent six years there and speaks the language and you know i've earned, earned the right to say that but interesting no that's yeah. a good call in terms of the population pyramid that definitely um makes sense i mean that's what we saw in in italy and and southern europe right is they're just like yo we need <laughs> we need young people yeah yeah, straight up, straight up. And, and that's not the case in Latin America. Mm -hmm. So you've been based in uh, Spain and, and now in Portugal, living the, the Latin life equivalent over in Europe. How how you like in Portugal, by the way? Uh, I like it a lot. It's, uh, you know, got the best climate that you can get in Europe, uh, I would say. Uh, it's uh, mild winters and summers that are not too hot. And uh, it's obviously, you know, great weather and nice people. Uh, yeah, I, I like it a lot here. I came, I, I mean, full disclosure, I used to live in Madrid, but then I came to Portugal for the tax benefits. For the NHR. The, yeah, that's right. The NHR. So that's why I'm here primarily. But uh, I don't want, I don't want to detract from Portugal as a country. It's a wonderful place to live. I, I really enjoy it. I also love Madrid. It's just, I would pay triple the tax in Madrid. So good, good. So you eat your Portuguese sweets, you eat the pastel de nata and all that. I'm not, I'm not big on sweets. <laughs> I'm more of the singularity is near stay alive as long as you can <laughs> kind of guy. You know. <laughs> I like that. That's good logic. How, how are you liking the, the NHR program? Um, has it met your expectations? Have you been disappointed on a few things? Uh, do you still recommend it to people? Uh, look, I, I, I don't recommend any uh, tax regime to anybody in particular because I can't because I'm not a tax lawyer. So this is not financial advice. But uh, I will say that uh, under the right circumstances, uh, you can get a great, great deal uh, with NHR for 10 years straight. Now, there is fine print. There's a lot of fine print. Uh, you know, what nature should your, like what form should your income take? You know, is it, is it salaried income? Is it dividends? Is it capital gains? Uh, is it royalties? Like you have to think this through because uh, the implications are, 
are serious if you if you get it wrong. So, uh, you know, NHR isn't suitable for everybody, but most people, especially if they come from a high tax country, should be able to get uh, a better deal in in Portugal. Not necessarily a radically better deal, but you know, especially if you're getting dividends. Uh, especially if you're not a majority owner in the company that's paying you the dividends, and even more especially if that if that company is in a jurisdiction with which Portugal has a dual tax agreement, uh, you can get some tremendous NHR deals uh, in Portugal. So yeah, I recommend it, but obviously uh, talk to a professional. Nice. I think. Um, do Do you think that Portugal is? Uh, has hit its peak and it's sort of declining as a couple commentators have said we saw peter levels uh gonzalo hall uh, a couple people say that maybe we reached reached peak portugal in late uh late 2020 or 2022 sorry yeah i mean it's hard to say i mean it depends on what uh, metric we're measuring right like population wise it's peaked yeah, it's pretty clear. Has it peaked economically? I don't think so. There's a there's a lot of in terms of like government policy. If I if I were to take over Portugal tomorrow, there's like a lot of low hanging fruit. Uh, <laughs> the, the, there's a there's a there's a lot of easy policy no, moves. I, you I can guess make. I mean as like a digital nomad and expat hub in the NH, NHR and all that. Do you think? Uh, I mean NHR is still here. Uh, the D7 visa is still here. Uh, the weather's still nice. Uh, yep. The cost of living is, you know, the lowest in Western Europe. Um, has it peaked? I mean, who knows? Maybe it's maybe it's peaked. I mean, Portugal hasn't changed that much. It's a, I guess there are more foreigners here than there were a few years ago. I just yeah. just today I see that uh, there are now eight hundred thousand foreigners here. So that's like eight percent of the population, up from seven percent right. last year. Dude, the the D seven D eight visa mm. is pretty crazy, actually. Like, I feel I feel like it's unique in Europe. I haven't. This is a new thought that I'm having, but the D eight the D seven D eight is like very unique in the world of, um, you know, re- residency and investment migration, right? Because it's kind of like, you know, independent means spend nine months a year, work towards citizenship. There's not too many places that kind of have that and allow anyone well. to rock up. Well, D7 is kind of a, it, it's a pretty conventional independent means visa. D8, I guess, is the entrepreneur, no, uh, it's a startup visa, or it's a highly qualified activity visa, if I'm not uh, mistaken. That requires some investment, 175000 is a number I hear bandied around, Uh but yeah, they both lead to citizenship, and uh, and Portugal actually does give citizenship in year five, or uh, once mm-hmm. year five is over, you just got to learn the language. So you know, I I think those are very you know, if you want to live in Portugal, if you actually want to live here, then yeah, D seven is. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, in my case, I'm European. I didn't need any visa, but if you're from outside of Europe and you want to live in Portugal, I think D seven is a very easy option. Yeah, for sure. I know a lot of people going for it. And I don't know, it, to me, it seems like it's it's pretty unique. There's not too many countries where it's like, hey, if you want to spend the majority of the year here, you can <laughs> and work towards citizenship. It's like, uh, well, uh, Greece has the same, right? The FIP visa and uh, elective residency in Italy and uh, non-lucrative in Spain. Uh, Even as like a non-European, you could do the Italy one? Yeah. Really? Yeah, if, okay. yeah, cause, yeah, because if you're European... Then you don't need a visa. Yeah, yeah. All right. Interesting. Yeah, you probably know more a few more programs than I do. Yeah, no, but these are just these are essentially independent means visas. Just show us that you have enough income uh, that you know you won't become a charge on the state. You won't become a burden to us, and then you're you're well and obviously spend the majority of your time here and consume here and pay tax here, and then you're welcome to to join us. And I I think it makes sense if you're a country to attract people mm-hmm. you know who who are demonstrably productive and who want to consume and pay tax in your country great exactly. all countries should have that yeah. hey guys quick interruption to tell you about bit refill 
BitRefill is the best way to convert your crypto into gift card balances. These are gift cards that you can spend at Hotels.com, Airbnb, Nike, and many more. You may remember Joel Valenzuela, previous podcast guest. He's been living on crypto exclusively since 2015, and he's a big consumer of BitRefill. And so I asked Joel, I said, what do you like most about BitRefill? He said that he likes the instant delivery, the precise amount so that you don't have to juggle a lot of gift cards, and he loves the global selection. Nobody else has this much selection of gift cards, over 10,000 gift card options across hundreds of countries. Go to bitrefill.com to sign up, and you can also use the code MyLatinLife for 10% back off your first purchase. Go to bitrefill.com for more information. Exactly, exactly. Dude, I wanted to just kind of relive the idea, rehash the idea that we're, we're really living in a crazy time in terms of investment migration and residencies and second passports. I just feel like there's so many themes that are sort of meshing together or in, and coming about at the same time. And it's all super crazy, like people getting to work remote yeah. for the first time. Right. Um, you have birth tourism uh, becoming more viable. You have the network state with crypto and the metaverse. Yeah. You have uh, a lot more information online about tax havens these days. You have mm -hmm. online businesses being a lot more common than they used to be. Uh, you have movements around self-sovereignty and global mobility and all these um, books. And now you're having, um, you know, like thought leaders and internet personalities talking about sovereignty. Yeah. Uh, you're having, you know, this world where you can collect multiple passports. You have e-residency coming up with uh, Estonia and Lieberland and all these like crazy different things are kind of coalescing and, and being invented at the same time. They're sort of overlapping in new ways. And I feel like people are iterating a lot on um, what citizenship means. And we're really questioning like, what is the nation state? We're mm -hmm. questioning, you know, what is citizenship? And we're questioning just even things like what is domicile? What is tax residency? Yeah. What is the tax home? Those are all like different things. What is a legal resident? What's a tax resident? Um, how does that fit into the nation state? How does that fit into like maybe a broader organization like NATO or the EU and you're in it or you're out of it? And, yeah. and there's just so many things going on. Add, add on driverless cars on top of that. And <laughs> it's just, you know, there's so many things coming down the pipeline at the same time. Yeah. You know, I always say that imagine how well governments would treat us if we all had multiple citizenships. Mm -hmm. Like that is my dream. I mean, and I realize this is far in the future. We're at the early stages of this, but I would like, I have a dream. I have a dream where each of us has four or five citizenships, multiple residencies, uh, homes in different uh, continents, savings in different banks, different jurisdictions. We have hard wallets uh, buried in different secret locations. Uh, essentially, we should make ourselves ungovernable because we don't want to be under the thumb of any individual state, because that's a recipe for disaster and terrible treatment. So, um, yeah, stack sats, stack citizenships, stacks residencies, stack groups of friends in in you know cities that you like, uh, places where you can go at the drop of a hat if things turn sour. You know, ask not what you can do for your country, ask what your next country can do for you. That's what I say, like uh, just it, diversify yourself internationally. And if enough of us do that, and it doesn't even have to be the majority, it just has to be like the 1% who mm -hmm. pay half of all the income tax uh, and therefore have the leverage over the state. Like if, if, if the top 1% of people in terms of income become multinational, ungovernable individuals, then we'll force the countries to treat us better because there is now a global competition going on for capital and talent and both capital and talent are now ultra mobile mm -hmm. and each country must compete to attract them and they must prevent losing them 
And so some countries, the way they're doing, they're trying to like hem people in, like fence them in with exit taxes, etc. But that's kind of just the rigor mortis of a dying form of government, I think, where uh, they realize what's happening and they're trying to, you know, squeeze as much as they can out of these uh, cash cows for as long as they can. But in the future, countries will have to compete for the favor of sovereign individuals. And I think that's where we're going. And, th and the best way for you to make sure that the government treats everybody better, not just the people who have money, everybody, the best way for you to make sure they treat you better is to uh, have a diversified portfolio of residencies and citizenships and assets and, and spread it all around the world. Because, uh, you know, if you don't have competition between countries, I mean, what happens in an environment of no competition? What do you get? You get like uh, the post office or the DMV, right? They don't have to treat you well because where are you going to go? And so that's the case. I mean, we wouldn't, we wouldn't, you know, any other service or product that we buy, we always shop around. We always compare what's on offer. We, you know, companies have to vie for our demand and we should, we should approach governments like that as well. Countries, we should shop around for countries. We should, we should play them up against each other. We should take the thing we like from that country and then, you know, let's say, oh, I like the health insurance in country A, but I like the banking in country B. Yep. And, I, and I like the property rights in country C. And you shop around and you do jurisdictional arbitrage that way. And, and uh, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to make the world more free by trying to influence politics from the inside because it's like trying to join the mafia and turn it into a philanthropic organization. It's just not that's not what that organization was set up to do. That's not the purpose of that organization. What you have to do as an individual is to get freedom in your own life. And the way to do that is to diversify yourself geographically, globally, make sure you have multiple citizenships and, and assets around the world. Mm -hmm. And yeah, 1% of people do that. And we'll get a much, much freer world. So I'm, I'm glad that uh, you and me were, were kind of leading the charge. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, uh, jurisdictional arbitrage is the term that you used. And people probably know it in to some extent where maybe the alcohol is cheaper over state lines, right? So you, right. you, you go and drive to New Hampshire and, and you get your alcohol, you bring it back or something like that. Yeah. Tax-free cigarettes. Uh, yeah. and, and now... And now we're we're at the level as digital nomads, internet entrepreneurs, and expats that we're kind of playing nation states against each other. And and as you're predicting, nation states are going to have to compete with each other more in the future. Mm -hmm. What's that going to look like? How's that going to change our relationship with the state? Or how can people sort of position themselves uh, best towards a changing world? Uh, so what? Well how is our relationship with the state going to change? I mean, right now, one of the reasons, one of the, one of the obstacles to this utopia that I'm describing is that people have a sentimental relationship with the state. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we went to the same schools. I know in America you had to say the Pledge of Allegiance, I think. Yeah, uh, national anthem. Yeah, this kind of, there's a national anthem. There's a national football team that everybody has to cheer for. There's a national bird, whatever. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, we've been inculcated. This has been inculcated. In a, I mean, it's we've been indoctrinated, essentially. Yeah, to it's a bit of propaganda into the nation states. Like, why do you only sing the Norwegian national anthem and... Not, not the French the, one, right? Not the French one, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so well, the reason is that if you are a group of people that calls itself a government and proclaims the right because you know it says so on the paper that you wrote, uh, that you have the right to rule over the people within these geographical confines, then you have to engage in that sort of... Uh, it's almost like a religious ritual where you yeah, have to the thinking of like, I'm part of this group. I'm, We're I'm, against all the other groups. Correct. <laughs> you know, just talk about a, you asked me for anecdotes earlier. I was in a taxi one time in China. I always used to talk to the taxi drivers cause a it's 
great way to learn the language and be they they kind of give you a window into the soul of the nation right because they're kind of uh, yeah they're kind of they, the, they got their ear to the ground yeah yeah and they're like pretty average people you know they're pretty representative and i remember uh, they always used to ask me you know where are you from and i always answer oh, i'm from norway and uh this one taxi driver he asked me like oh what's the population of norway and i was like it's five million uh, it's like the same as this uh this uh neighborhood in shanghai and he said, oh, only five million. And and he was, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, I f he felt sorry for me because, you know, I was part, like, how 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 pitiful was I coming from such a small country? Uh, you know, and it really hit home for me that, you know, to him, he derives, uh, his identity is really wrapped up with the group that he belongs to, the Chinese people. And Chinese people being 1.35 billion or whatever, that gave him like a sense of greatness as an individual, even though in his personal life, he may not have amounted to much. At least he was part of this, this greater whole. And that gave him a sense of identity and belonging and pride even. I, I also don't think it makes sense to be proud of your nationality because it's like, it's like being proud of your eye color because you're not... You know, you didn't do anything to earn your nationality. You can't take credit for that. But the flip side of that is you don't have to take the blame for anything your nation does, right? So you can't take credit, but you also don't need to take any blame. Um, but anyway, people have this sentimental connection with the country. And I think uh, once you start having multiple countries, you dilute that that sense of, right. of uh, emotional connection uh, to your, your country. So if we can, and, and, I, and I see this happening now. I see this happening for people in our generation who ha have traveled a great deal more, who speak more languages, who, who yeah. don't just read the local. They're from like, like a multinational background, maybe. Yeah, that too. And then, you know, when my parents were growing up, it was like, there's like one channel on TV and, you know, here's the six o'clock news and here's what we want you to think. Right. And now we're all getting our news and information from a very diverse uh, set of sources. And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, BS online. So we've had to learn how to navigate and distinguish real news from fake news in a way that our parents never had to. And so that, that by the way, I think is why our parents are so afraid about fake news because they have never learned how to distinguish uh, BS on the internet from the truth, right? So mm -hmm. it, it, it worries them. But anyway, that's a digression. Point is, our generation, I think, is way more receptive to international uh, seeing themselves as individuals in the world rather than identifying themselves because of belonging to a particular ethnic or national group, right? I, I have a lot more in common with the people like you're Canadian. I'm Norwegian. I have a lot more in common with you philosophically and in terms of values than with the average Norwegian. And it's changing goalposts too, because these nation states never maintain their borders for more than like 200 years. And um, yeah. like, it's, it's not a fixed thing, I guess. No, it's not. It's, uh, you know, who is the, who, who's dominant here and now in this region? I mean, nation states are essentially, uh, I know, I know people will think I'm an extremist when I say this, but I think of governments as organized crime. It's just that it is the most, a government is simply the most dominant organized crime group in any particular geographical area. They are so dominant, in fact, that they have chased out uh, or at least marginalized every other organized crime group in that country. And they have a monopoly <laughs> on on extort, extorting right. the citizens of that country. And uh, yeah, so it's well, it's it's yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I get it. Random side question. Did you ever have like a particular interest in the Italian mafia or other types of organized crime? Because I still love that stuff. And I can, and sometimes I like draw connections between the two themes. Yeah, I, I like that stuff. And, 
you know, you'll you'll note that they're not that different. I mean, there is a difference in degree between the mafia and the state, but there's not really a difference in kind. You know, the, the mafia had its omerta, the mafia had, you know, rules and they had conventions and they had norms that they followed. And, you know, if you paid them off, they didn't do anything to you. If you didn't pay them off, they they might burn down your store or whatever. And the state essentially does that, but it's become so successful at it that it's it's codified uh, mm-hmm. its extortion. And it's even been able to, I mean, smart move obviously was taking over education because then you can, <laughs> th- th- then you can tell people that, no, actually we are this like patriarchic group that w- we care about you and we only want to do what's best for you. And if you didn't have us to take half your income and redistribute in the country, it would be total chaos and, and, you know, anarchy became a bad word. Um, and so, yeah, it's just a state is simply the dominant and most successful um, organized crime group in a particular yeah. geographical area. Things are going to have to change if only just because the debts and the currency stuff, it's just getting too insane. Yeah. It makes me, this is a, a random new idea I have, but it makes me think of how, you know, how private corporations used to give lifelong pensions, right? In, mm-hmm. in America, we had the unions and the you know, the TV company and all that, they used to give lifelong pensions. Right. And then they, they switched over. Uh, there's a finance term for this, but they switched over from a, um, they switched to a contribution model where it says like, Hey, you put 5% towards your retirement. Yeah. We'll match you. Yeah. We'll do matching contributions. So they switched. So they basically were able to get off all these obligations off of the books yeah. by just doing matching and not having to have these like lifelong liabilities on the books. And I feel like countries might have to do something like that too. Like they might just have to start doing like, Hey, we'll do a matching contribution or something, but we got to get all these insane liabilities off the books because that's kind of seems to be one of the, it's like one of the last like mainstays of the nation state where it's like, look, I need my nation state because I need my pension, but it's also kind of their demise as, as well in a way. Yeah, uh, that's true. That's ironic, right? That the mainstay would be the thin end of the wedge that ends it all, right? Uh, you know, when I first came to Portugal, I was uh, trying to take my income as, uh, I, like I, uh, as a I was going to, or something. No, that's what I do now. But I was going to take it as a, a salary. Yeah. And they said, "Oh, it's a twenty percent flat tax." I said, "Okay, that's that's a big improvement from what I'm paying now." Um, Oh, but what about this this little point here? It says eleven uh, percent social security. You didn't mention that. So, oh no, but that's that's not a tax. That's uh, social security. You get that back when you retire. Uh, I said, well, is it optional? Like, like unless it's optional, it's a tax. That's number one. Second, there is no way in hell that that money is going to be there by the time I retire. In fact. It's been spent already before I even retire. I mean, before I even pay it in, that money has been spent. And so you're right. Like you have these huge unfunded liabilities all over the Western world. Uh, The government knows there's no way it can pay it for any. uh, I mean, what they promised to pay out, they have already spent. So it's just not going to be there when you grow up, when, when when you get old, when you retire. And so I think when people start to see that, uh, that'll liberate them. That'll liberate them from that that final tie that they have to to the nation state. Of course, you can you can still, you know, for now, uh, social security still will pay you, and there's still some money to pay, you know, uh, social security, and you can still live in Latin America and receive that pension, right? I'm not mm-hmm. listen. I, I'm not telling people to give up their U.S. citizenship. I. I Obviously, that's a that's a difficult decision to make. Mm-hmm. It's not the right decision for everybody. There could be unforeseen consequences of it later down the line. You don't know, um, and it's it sucks for Americans that they have to give up their citizenship in order to enjoy um, the majority of or the, the best tax breaks, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like as a as a Norwegian or as anybody who's not American or Eritrean, I guess um, we. 
we can we can move and get better tax terms, but Americans unfortunately can't. And that's another sure. trend that I'm a little bit worried about: the uh, proliferation of citizenship based taxation. I could see mm-hmm. some European countries, probably Australia, New Zealand. I could totally see them uh, trying that move too. Uh, and it's it seems to me like they're trying to baby step the way there. Like they're not just outright going to be like, like yo, citizenship based. Let's go. Like it's more. It's more. They're going to ease it in with like, hey you know, three years after you give up residency or, you know, worldwide capital gains, but not worldwide earned income yeah. or, you know, worldwide inheritance tax, but not worldwide to everything else. And so they're just like, oh no, it's only this one thing that's worldwide, not everything. Yeah. And, um, but, but it'll kind of like, no, that's how they always do it. Its way up. Yeah. That, of course, that's the smart way to do it. Anybody who's read Robert Cialdini's influence will know that anybody who's been in sales understand that, you know, uh, incremental changes is what uh, what you should what you should impose to get people to to follow you and and not resist, right? Um, so yeah, for sure, that's the case. As we're starting to wrap up, I wanted to I have one random question, and then I wanted to get your kind of advice mm. to uh, to to a couple of groups of people. But my one random question was. You know the industry quite well. You know tens of thousands of, of professionals in this industry. What percentage of them are are practicing it as well and are are living abroad and stacking multiple residencies, getting CBI passports, all these bank account stuff? Or do you think people are really taking action, or do you think the people that are really taking action, a la Andrew Henderson, are are a bit unique? Well, Andrew is at one end of the scale. Right, because uh, he is really, I mean, is a true pioneer in this. Um, so, but but just people, you're asking, you know, the people who work in the industry, are they living? Are they practicing what they preach? Are they themselves getting residencies and citizenships elsewhere? I would say yeah. yes, to to a great extent, they are. Uh, to the extent that they can afford it, they are. Absolutely. Uh, at least, uh, you know, gathering residencies. I know a lot of people in the industry who are doing that. And, uh, you know, probably half the people that I know in the industry don't live in their country of birth. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so yeah, for sure. And a lot of, a lot of people also are clients first and then they, they end up seeing the industry from the inside and then they join it and start really? working. Yeah. I, I know a lot of stories like that. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Cool. Well, we'll start wrapping up. Uh, I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, I thought maybe like a fun last question would be to get your advice to the listeners out there for two different groups of people. Okay. First, the advice to a younger version of yourself, maybe a 20-year-old or 18-year-old version of yourself, uh, some life advice for 18-year-old Christian. And then also advice to the uh, retirees and soon-to-be retirees out there, sort of older demographic uh, in terms of maybe retiring abroad or how to um, extend the range of options that they have. Okay. Uh, So to a younger version of myself, uh, just in terms of life quality, Try um, start build start building an audience. I think is a good a good thing. Like uh, start today to build an audience on social media, build an email list. It doesn't really matter so much what it is you do. You can figure out that later. But you know you you you're probably going to be playing around in different fields and learning different trades, etc. But if you have an audience. Uh, then especially an audience, like if you've been very authentic with your voice, then you'll have people who think like you and are interested in the same things as you. And then later down the line, you can probably find services or products to offer to that audience. And this is something you can do on the side while you're going to school, while you're you know working at some stepping stone job that you probably don't want to have for the rest of your life. Because the goal should be financial independence, right? So you don't want to be um, you don't want to be an employee for the rest of your life. 
not to knock. I mean, I've been an employee and I've learned a lot from being an employee. I, I see being an employee as a great way to get paid to learn. Uh, so definitely re- recommend um, uh, working for a company in an industry that you're interested in and learning those skills. Personally, I think I spent too much time in school. I would probably, if I if I were to do it all over again, I would have dropped out of school. I mean, I have a bachelor's degree and then I have a master's degree. I probably could have stopped at bachelor's and just started started earlier with my entrepreneurial stuff, started earlier getting work experience. Um, so that's one thing I would do differently. But yeah, uh, start building your side hustle early. Uh, start gaining skills, stack skills. That's really important. So there's this concept called the, uh, I think it's called the skill stack or the something stack. Uh, this is from... Uh, What's the guy, the, the, um, Scott Adams, the guy who writes mm-hmm. Dilbert? Right. I think, I think that's the first place where I heard about the skill stack. And basically he's saying, look, you could either be the world's best at one particular, in one particular domain, like you can be Lionel Messi or you can be whatever, the world's greatest violinist and you'll get super rich and successful. But that's... You know, only only one in several million people can do that. Well, but the 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 more viable route is to build complementary skill sets that you can stack on top of each other. So, for example, in a in, unique way, yeah, uh, that gives you what what Naval Ravikant refers to as special knowledge. Right? If you have special knowledge and you have accountability, then uh, people will pay you. Right? And so. In my case, you know, I learned a bunch of languages, but just knowing a bunch of languages in itself is not super useful. But when you combine that with knowing about investment migration and with knowing how to write well in English uh, and knowing how to do some video editing and knowing how to do a little bit of web development and knowing how to do a little bit of this and that and the other, uh, you know, I, I've now built a product kind of around me that if I were to replace myself, I would need like eight or nine people. Uh, just to get the same stuff done because I've, I've designed the whole business around my personal skill set. And so try to find, try, like, you know, obviously follow the things you're interested in. You have to be interested in whatever it is you're doing because if you're not interested, then people who are interested and genuinely like the the subject will just outcompete you. So you definitely got to uh, follow your interests and, and, and just build skills, man. Like try different things, uh, you know, play around with building websites or recording podcasts or mm-hmm. making videos or writing books or whatever. And, um, and, and yeah, stack skills, stack skills and, and don't stay in school too long. So the, and I, the other I 100%, one, I a hundred percent agree with that. Yeah. Uh, both those things, that was, uh, uh an excellent answer. I, I'm afraid I don't know, you know, I don't have experience being old, right? Uh, I have experience being young, but not old. Mm-hmm. Um, what so have you for, seen just in terms of like maybe pitfalls or, or things uh, from, from the clients that doing the golden visas and stuff that you've seen? Or just um, people maybe looking for greener pastures? Uh, I think... Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, <laughs> I, think a lot, I think a lot of people just wait too long. They put it off. Um they they end up you know not making the move uh, out of inertia and then one day they're kind of too old or too settled in their ways to make the change so you know set yourself up for the the final third of your life by you know it's really important to decide like for the young people have to decide what they do and then the middle-aged people, they have to decide who they do it with. But then old people, it's also really important, you know, where where are you going to be? Because once you're old, you have less energy. And typically you have more money, but you have less energy. And so uh, you want to try to find your Shangri-La, let's say, or multiple Shangri-Las uh, while you still have the energy. So that when you get like truly old, uh, don't have that energy, then you're already kind of set that's what i would say but but then again um 
what what do I know about being old? So. <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. Speaking of Shangri La, dude, Tower Mina was super cool. Oh um, yeah, super yeah. Nice. Between you and one of my other buddies that put it on the map for me, I was like, you know what? People are talking about Tower Mina. Let's go check it out. You I know why it, people? Man. You know why people cool. are talking about it? Because it was in season two of White Lotus on HBO. I've heard this. I heard Sicily in general grew in popularity a lot because yeah. of the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, I was there before it got cool. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I spent a whole week there. I did, I did the Godfather tour oh, yeah? um, in Savoca. I did a bunch of stuff. I, I, I enjoyed it. Yeah. That was yeah. Cool. cool, man. Uh, well, yeah, let's wrap up the episode. Yeah. Um, my guest again today was Christian Nesheim. Nesheim. Very good. Nesheim. Nesheim. Christian Nesheim from IMI Daily investment migration insider the number one trade publication newsletter for the investment migration that's right industry. that's right thank you so much for having me on the show it's been a pleasure you've uh, given me a lot of latitude to talk about the things that are dear to me so i appreciate that for thank you for letting me talk yeah dude thanks for coming on and, and great to catch up and uh looking forward to supporting each other in the future yeah see you soon man